come to know you, that you'd use us this week to, to, to really point them to you. God, that you would lead them to yourself. Father, we ask for that. Please speak through me. May people in here see you. May they, may they not see me. God, may they hear you and not hear me. And may you have your way here today. In your name we pray. Amen. Have you ever heard of the phrase, the phenomenon, that referred to as the Lazarus effect? Uh, we've been talking about this for the last few weeks. This is the last Sunday of it. The Lazarus effect is when someone is declared dead from a cardiac arrest and then suddenly shows signs of life, usually within 10 minutes after CPR is concluded. And it really makes it seem like the person has died and came back to life. And really, that's not really what happened. They're kind of just kind of out for a little bit and resuscitated. This is a rare phenomenon. It's only happened to at least 63 people that we know of since it was first described back in 1982. Now, the reason it's called the Lazarus effect is because of the story found in John 11 of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, this was not a resuscitation. This wasn't a matter of him being passed out or dead for 10 minutes. He was dead for four days. And Jesus says, raise up, rise up. And he has the power to do that. We've been processing this story over the last few weeks and talking about how it applies to us today. In fact, today is the last week. And, and really, last week's point, if you want to cover that really quick to, re, to just get a refresher, was this. Jesus is the source of every Lazarus effect. And this source will be seen as something sweet or sour by those who see it. Remember, we talked about Jesus being the source of someone, anyone, seeing something not best die in order to see something better live. Only Jesus has the power to turn things around, to go from addiction to freedom, to go from shame to security, to go from tragedy to triumph. Jesus is the source of every Lazarus effect. But when the people saw that source of being a, a power being Jesus, some saw it as something sour, like these religious leaders. That's eh, something sour. I don't really want that. Th this power is threatening to me. I, I don't want this power in my life or bugging me. And these leaders felt the same way. They're like, this is a threat to our way of life, to how we do things. We don't want this power. But there were others who saw this source of power as something sweet. And that was Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany was the one who, who was hosting Jesus along with her siblings, Martha and the newly raised up Lazarus, were having a dinner with, with Jesus. And she ends up going back and, and getting some perfume from, from somewhere in her house. And she opens that up and just anoints his feet. And, and just washes his feet with her hair. Incredible moment. Of her responding to this incredible power and seeing him as someone who's sweet. And his power is something as sweet. Now, we want people to see the power of Jesus as something sweet, not sour. This is just one part of the Lazarus effect, taking, talking specifically about the effect that this life change can have on others. When they see Jesus in us and through us. In fact, I, I want to sum up what the Lazarus effect is, and I say it this way. The Lazarus effect is a life-changing result caused by Jesus. It's something that happens to the believer, through the believer, and around the believer. Two weeks ago when we started this series, we talked about, really I'll sum it up, it was the Lazarus effect happening to us. It's something that dies in us where something's resurrected, something or something better. It's us saying no to ourselves, saying yes to Jesus. That's what's also symbolized in baptism. When we go down to the water and come back out, we're saying that's what happened to us. And we said, yeah, we believe you're God and I'm not. But I'm dying to myself being in charge. And I'm, I want something better where you're in charge. That was two weeks ago. Last week we talked about really what it looks like through the believer. How there's an effect that happens through us that people will see a source that, that in us. And the source is either sweet or sour. This week, we're talking about the Lazarus effect on those around us. There's something that happens around them, around us. Something that, that we have a little bit of say-so in and some that we don't. Depending on how people really are impacted or affected by this incredible power. This around us is where we go back to the story and we conclude this part of Lazarus. And I never thought about this till this, this year. That if you look at the last week or so before Christ goes to the cross... There's so many incredible stories. But there are three particular so stories involving Lazarus that I want to focus in on. And that's what we're doing today. 
In fact, today, we're, 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 we're on the whole weeks, the last couple weeks we've been doing it. But today, I want to sum up with this last question, okay? What does the Lazarus effect look like on those around us? At home, at work, at school, and why should we care? Why should we care at all? Let's go back to where we left off last Sunday. Jesus replied, uh, after Mary is really washing his, his feet with her hair and that perfume, there was a, a, a disciple of Jesus who goes, hey, what are you doing? You're wasting money here. This, 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 could, this perfume could be sold to actually feed the poor or feed the hungry. This is ridiculous. And Jesus says, shut up. Just shut up in a real nice, loving way. Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. We talked about that last week. If you, if you look at the verses, the immediate verse after this whole moment where he defends Mary and what she's doing with the perfume, this is the next verse. It says this, when all the people heard of Jesus, his arrival, at the home of Lazarus, Mary and Martha, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus is raised from, the de- raised from the dead. I love that. What a cool nickname for Lazarus. He's the man that Jesus raised from the dead. Wouldn't that be a cool nickname for you? That people just said, oh, that's the guy that Jesus raised from the dead. That's the woman that Jesus raised from the dead. That's the person that, get, that God did something so significant in their life that they're no longer that person anymore. There's something, there's, there's something different about them. That's the nickname that Lazarus gets. And you see this too in this short verse, how there's a flocking. People are drawing near. They want to see not only Jesus, but they want to see Lazarus too. I mean, the guy was dead just days ago, and now he's back. They're just enthralled by this. It draws attention. There is a story that Ken Davis writes about a woman who looked out her window and saw her German shepherd shaking the life out of a neighbor's rabbit. Her family did not get along well with these neighbors, so this was going to be a disaster. Even though German shepherds are so cute, okay, so dang cute. Even this one right here is like, look, I found a tree. Anyway, so uh, this is, German shepherds are so cute and so wonderful, I love them. And, but this German shepherd is just shaking this neighbor's rabbit just really to death. And she, she grabbed a broom and, and pummeled the dog until it dropped the now extremely dead rabbit out of its mouth. She panicked. She did not know what else to do. She grabbed the rabbit, took it inside, gave it a bath, blow-dried its fur to its original fluffiness, combed it until the rabbit was looking good, snuck into the neighbor's yard, and propped the rabbit back into the little outdoor sleeping area that was next door. An hour later, she heard screams coming from the next door. She asked her neighbor, what's going on? What's going on? And the neighbor's like, our rabbit, our rabbit. Her neighbor cried, he died, he died two weeks ago. We buried him, and now he's back. You know, it's like, <laughs> Things that die then come back to life, they tend to gather attention. They, they grab a lot of attention. This was true of Lazarus's case. How about yours? Have, have you grabbed any attention by saying yes to Jesus? Or do people see the same person? Are, are you like, in other words, are you living like, like multiple lives? Like different life, like you have like a church life that you live and you're like, yeah, yeah, this is my Jesus life. But then you step into work mode. Work mode is like you're serious, you know, and you're just kind of, let's go beyond serious. You're kind of mean. You're, you're sort of demanding. You're sort of a jerk, you know. Uh, you know, but you have to be, you tell, your, tell yourself. Or, or, or maybe there's like home mode where you're just kind of like all about you. And you don't serve anybody. You're all about them serving you because you've told yourself this is my home. And then you step back into Jesus mode. Oh, Jesus mode. I love Jesus mode. He's so good. Friends, there should be one mode, one life that is changed by Jesus and seen at home and at work at all times. And this incredible life change will draw attention where people will say to you, what's wrong with you? What's happened to you? And you go, what? Well, they go, you used to be this way, but now you're something better. And, And when people see this, there's going to be an impact around us. In fact, I, I want to just categorize it and sum it up real simply. I believe that this effect that Jesus, that the life change that Jesus brings to us on those around us can be summed up in this way. The Lazarus effect on others around us can be summed up in two words, receive or remove. The first effect sounds nice, Chris, but the second one sounds a little scary. You don't mean remove, remove, do you? I do. Well, not in every case, of course, but in some, I know there are Christians around the world 
our brothers and sisters in Nigeria right now are being killed. They're just being, they're being slaughtered because they love Jesus. It's, it's happening. It's always happened. I mean, we, we think we have it tough here in, in America. We don't have a clue compared to what other brothers and sisters of ours are going through. And it's not because they live in, in a bad country. It's because they love Jesus and they're being killed. And, and there are other, again, levels and degrees of being removed. That would be the ultimate removal, to get out of here. But there's other levels of removal where people will say, we don't want you working here anymore because of your faith. We, we, don't, want you, we don't want you around here anymore because of your faith. We, we, we're going to remove you from the text thread, remove you from the party scene, remove you from, from this, this kind of gathering that we used to have that you've been going to for years because you don't fit anymore. We're going to remove you. Or you're going to be received. Similar to how Mary received Jesus. And, and just, just there was an incredible love and appreciation and, and, and inclusion. There's going to be reception or removal when it comes to this Lazarus effect impacting other people. In fact, you see it right here happening in the following verse. Going back to the story of Lazarus. After Mary washes the feet and after people are flocking to the house because they want to see Jesus and Lazarus, it says this, that the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. What? Maybe you've never heard this. Like you know that they want to kill Jesus. You've heard that story every Palm Sunday or Easter, but you've never heard that they want to kill Lazarus too. They, they want him gone. And, and I want to ask you why. Why do you think they want him gone? We're going to process that a little bit today in this first part of the message. But I will say this. Here's the big point today. And this is the big point that just it really grabs my heart at least. I hope it grabs yours. See, the Lazarus effect will lead people to receive you or want you removed. But remember, this response should be because of what Jesus has repaired in you and not because of what you've rebuked in them. Let me ask you, why did the religious leaders want to kill Lazarus? What did Lazarus do? The answer is nothing. He did nothing. He simply walked into a room and was alive. They wanted to kill him simply because he'd been made alive by Jesus. Simply because Jesus had repaired something broken in his life. This is why they wanted to remove Lazarus. Because of something that Jesus had done, not Lazarus. And you might be thinking, yeah, Chris, I get it. People want to remove me all the time. They don't like what I have to say on Facebook, Instagram, X, whatever. They don't like how I, I speak the truth. And I get in their face. I tell them how it is. They don't like that. Friend, I, if, if that's how you're receiving this point behind me, I, I, think you're, I think you're off. And I think this story reminds us of, of really the, the real source of why people respond in such a way. Lazarus had done nothing except be alive and, and really show the repair that has been made in his life. And yet they wanted to kill him. Because of something Jesus did, not what he did, or rebuked in someone else. See, I want you to look at this picture real quick, okay? And I, I did a little cheap, little quick edit on the screen there. And, and I want someone to notice, please tell me what you notice in the little edit that I have on the sign there. Anybody? What do you notice? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I'll call you. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the lowercase t, right? And so, so get this. And this is how we are. We, we, we tell ourselves, I think, often as Christians, I'm just speaking my truth. I'm just speaking the truth. And we, we connect our truths to the Bible and we say, hey, listen, this is in there. I can find it. And we even say things like, it's biblical. If anyone ever tells you it's biblical, I want you to stop for a second and go, okay, what do you mean by that? Because do you know that biblical is in the, in the eye of the beholder? Do you know that? What do you mean by Chris? Well, if it's in the Bible, that's wonderful. It's a great spot to start. But people, every one of us, interpret the Bible differently with a lens. And we end up using it, this Bible so often sometimes to beat people over the head with our lowercase truths instead of reminding them of the large capital T truth. Let me give you an example. 
we are in a, a, a culture right now that is divided. Would you agree? There are so many things happening right now in our culture dividing us. There are so many strong opinions out there on both sides. There, there are many of us Christians who have passion. We are passionate about certain truths. And we are convicted by these passions. And we lead with these passions. And, and they impact how we, how we vote or try to influence others to vote. And we say, you know what, I feel threatened because my truth isn't being ex- accepted. And this truth that I have, I'm so passionate about it, I want people to know, like this guy, how important it is. Friend, I'm going to push back on you lovingly. Lovingly. Be careful that your truth is not the lower key, l- lowercase truth. Because if you are trying to lead with a lowercase t truth, you risk having people miss the capital T truth. And you go, Chris, what's the capital T truth? It's very simple. It's that Jesus saves. How often do we in Christian culture jump to what I call the Z point? The Z point is an application. It's, it's what we, we want somebody to obey the law. You know, if you just listen to the law or we change the laws, and then people will be, will be motivated by laws. You know, that, I mean, we think this way. This is something that's happened for years not just here in America, but all of humanity, for a long time, we see at least played out in the Jewish people, like the laws. Like we have to do the law, and then this will make people do the right thing. That's the Z point. The A point is this. Simply lead them to Jesus. Let Jesus do the heart change in people where it won't matter if there's a law or not. It doesn't even matter. They will simply choose and want to follow Jesus because they realize that he saves he repairs. And how do they realize that? They see it in you. They see the repair in your life. That he's repaired things. Made things whole again. Helped you in the midst of your storm. People need to see this like they saw in Lazarus. And not see all the, oh, I'm not saying your, your lowercase t truths are important. But they're not as important as this one. This is the capital T. You see, some people around Jesus received him, some wanted him removed. Two different responses to the same reason why Jesus saves. He repairs. And this is what they didn't like. Some did like it, but the leaders didn't. This is why they wanted Lazarus dead. Check this out. Then leading, this is the rest of the verse. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. For it was because of what Jesus did to him that many people, many, many people had deserted them, the, the leaders, and believed in Jesus. It's, it's what Jesus had done, not because of what Lazarus said or rebuked in the leaders. And I want you to understand this for yourself too. Some people around you will receive you and some will want you removed. Two different responses, but it needs to be the same reason why. Because Jesus saves and he repairs. Let me ask you this friend, has Jesus saved you? What has he saved you from? I want you, this is, this is the, for you Christians in the room and online. Okay, don't be thinking about someone else out, out there. I'm talking about you. Has he saved you? Friend, what has he saved you from? Another way of saying it, what has he repaired in your life? And wh- or, or how about this, what is he currently saving you from? Because you might be able to answer the top two questions, but the third one you're like, I'm good. I'm good. Friend, I, I, believe, I believe personally that Jesus has saved me and he keeps saving me. Yeah, absolutely. He saved me back when I was 13 years old. And this idea of, of, of trying to find love by, by being a good boy and he just loved me for who I am, that was something that, that drew me to Jesus. He, he repaired something broken in my heart then. And he's been repairing me ever since. He's not done with me. There's still things in my life that, that need to be repaired. Like, I'm dealing with some, with some real anxiety lately, personally. I, I, it's, not, it's not been easy. I went through a medical thing back in September. It's still, it's still kind of haunting me. I have issues from day to day where all of a sudden I kind of like, I can't get past it. I'm worried about it happening again. These are things that, that, are, that are hurting me right now. And they bring worry and pressure on my chest and my, my head. And I find myself constantly going back to Jesus saying, I need your help. I need you to save me from this from this anxiety that I'm even going through now. Friend, what about you? 
What has he saved you from? What is he currently saving you from? This Jesus can repair things. But what about those things in life that could never be repaired, Chris? What about the death I'm dealing with, the tragedy? Ultimately, these things can never come back to life, Chris. Like, I'm really dealing with some significant things. And, and, And I want you to know that you're right. You are dealing. We all are. We are, have all dealt with some sort of trauma. There's degrees of it in our lives. And, and I really look at it this way, that there are lowercase I issues in our life. And there are uppercase I issues in our life. All, we all have it, even after saying, we all have issues, even after saying yes to Jesus. These issues are storms. And some of these storms we've caused and brought upon ourselves. Some of these storms are actually been caused and brought upon by others. Some of these storms have been caused just by life, living in a broken world. But I want you to know this, this little quote, okay? You know, you may not get to decide on the storm you're sailing through, but you do get to decide on who sails with you through it. This is a great little Hobby Lobby verse. It goes right on a cup. It's great. It'd be awesome. Or on a blanket or on a wall somewhere. But it reminds us that you and I get to actually decide who we sail through the storm with. Because of Jesus, we all have a repair story. And you go, Chris, no, it's it's not repaired. Friend, I I believe he can repair things not only physically, like like cure someone from cancer. He can also repair things inside that have been broken because of physical things that we've seen happen or lost. He can still repair this brokenness inside. He's repairing things in me. He's repairing things in you. And people in our world need to see how good our Jesus is by what he's repairing, not by what we're rebuking in them. Friend, again, the Lazarus effect will lead people to receive you or want you removed. But remember, this response should be because of of what Jesus has repaired in you and not because of what you've rebuked in them and told them to stop doing because it's biblical that you can stand on that point. Stand on the point that Jesus saves, first and foremost, friend. Let people see that. Let people see that. See, I mean, ask this question today, what does the Lazarus effect look like on those around us? What does it look like on those in our home? What does it look like on those at work, at school? And and what we just got got done talking about is that what it looks like is there people that will receive us or 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 really or 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 want us removed. That's what it looks like. Or they they just want us to know us to talk to you know, don't talk about it, basically. There'll be that response too. That's part of removing, kind of canceling us. And, or the people, that, again, that want to receive us. But why should you care? And this is why I think you should care. And if, I'm a big Star Wars fan. I love Star Wars. My favorite Star Wars film is The Empire Strikes Back. Um, there's so many lines from it that I love and remember and quote. There's lines like this that mean absolutely nothing to anyone else in the world, but I know exactly what part of the movie this is from. I know exactly who said it. I know who was being said to. A death mark's not an easy thing to live with. Does anyone want to know, uh, you see on there who said it, who was he talking to? Anybody? They have watched Star Wars? What do you guess? Oh, oh put your hand up. I'm just, I thought the hand over there. Go ahead. Han Solo is correct. And Han Solo, you got it, bud. So Han Solo, uh, basically he's got a death mark on his head and he tells General Riken that he's got to go. And, uh, and Riken says, yeah, death mark's not an easy thing to live with. And this death mark, this quote, is something that resonates with me as I read through the rest of the Lazarus story. There's a death mark placed on Lazarus' head. Lazarus had a death mark placed on him by some of those around him. They wanted him removed forever. Death marks are a part of the Lazarus effect. We deal with death marks all the time, and yet we don't even know it. We had a death mark on all of us, and we'll we'll get to that in a moment, but death marks are a part of the Lazarus effect. And there was one put on Lazarus. They wanted him dead. They put a head out on him. Now, here's a Bible trivia question for those that love the Bible, who are super biblical, who can remember all the things in the Bible that are super important. How about this important little tidbit? What did Jesus do in response to the death mark put on Lazarus? Don't raise your hands on this one. Don't say it out loud. Just think. What did Jesus do in response to the religious leaders putting a death mark on Lazarus? And Lazarus, by the way, is not just some schmo. This is like... One of his best friends. You go, Chris, Jesus, you didn't have best friends. Yeah, he did. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, best friends. Then he had the disciples, the 12. Were they friends? Sure. These, this was something special here. Lazarus gets a death mark. What does Jesus do? 
I mean, what would you do if a death mark was put on a loved one in your, in your life, in your home, in your workplace? A death mark is something serious and not easy to live with. What does Jesus do? Because the answer cannot be he did nothing. The answer cannot be move on to the next story. The answer is this. It's connected. This is connected to what we celebrate and call Palm Sunday. It's, it's connected. Jesus, in response to the death mark put on Lazarus, says, you know what? Now is the time. I'm, gonna, I'm making my way to Jerusalem. Now is the time. Now is the time to go ahead and get things done. Because I'm not going to let, and I love this. I love this part of Jesus. This is the stepping up, a stepping out. A, a, a Jesus who goes, you know, who hears about the death mark and goes, no, uh, no way. You're not going get, to get him. You're going to get me instead. You come after me. I know you want him, but you're going to come after me. Because I know ultimately you want me to begin with. You don't want him. You're mad at me. So Jesus does the unthinkable, and he does something in the tension that is so thick. Because the religious leaders, they don't like Jesus. They want to kill him. They're just, just, a, just a, a short distance away in Bethany from Jerusalem. I mean, it's right around the corner. And, and he goes to Jerusalem straight into it on a donkey. And people are going, yeah, this is great. But Jesus knows what he's doing. See, the next day after the death mark, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. He made his way to Jerusalem where these leaders reside. And they're waiting for him, not to slap him around, but to kill him. He's saying, you know what? I want, I'll take the death mark. Put it on me. Put it on me. Keep going in the story. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down to the road to meet Jesus. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. And as they're doing this, as they're shouting the, you know, the, these praises, this is where we get the word Hosanna. We sang a song about it earlier. Hosanna. It means, it means save me. God, you're God, I'm not, save me. It means all of that. And they're, and they're saying Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. You're amazing. You're amazing. This is the stuff that the religious leaders don't like. They're mad, even more mad about this. Jesus deserves this reception because he is king of kings. But I'm telling you. What he's doing by even riding on a donkey is more than just a peaceful, like, really kind of message. That's what he's sending instead of on a big steed. This is kind of a cultural thing too. And it also fulfills prophecy. But what he's also doing by riding on a, on a donkey is saying, hey, guys, look at me. Focus on me. I'm coming in. The death mark you have of my best buddy Lazarus, put it on me. I'll take the death mark instead. Oh, we call this Palm Sunday. And church history does something, I think, so stupid. We, we get so sucked up into the palms. The palm is just one part of it. It's a lowercase t truth. It's not bad. It's, it's, it's a lowercase t truth. The palms were there as a rebellious sign. And this is what culturally they would do. They'd wave palms, the people would. That was a rebellious note to, to, to the Roman Empire. That was something that was seen as like a, like a certain type of flag or something or some sort of signal that says, we don't like you authority, we like this authority instead. That's what the palms are for. That's a small lowercase t truth of this entire story. Because what's happening in a bigger part of the story is something that we see here. And I love how it says this. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Your king is coming riding on a donkey's colt. Your king is on the way. Your king is, is going to come make things right. Have you ever read the books, the Chronicles of Narnia? Do you, do you remember Aslan the lion? Do you remember uh, the, the, the lion, witch, and the road robe, that book, where that one kid, Edmund, was one of the, was one of the, one of the, the sons of Adam? And Edmund was kind of a screw-up. Edmund kind of like, he kind of like went off the, the beaten path, sort of a rebellious guy teamed up with even kind of the evil, evil kind of dark person in the story. And, and then Edmund basically, because of his, his choices, had to die. He had to die in the story. And, and what happened in the story, Aslan steps up and he says, no, 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 you kill me instead, not Edmund. Friend, I want you to know something. You and I are the Edmunds. We're the Edmunds. We're the ones who mess up constantly. Aslan is the Christ figure who steps in and says, I got it. I'll take care of it. I, I, you put it on me. I'll die in, in Edmund's place. That's what Jesus did. And this Palm Sunday, there's a better name for it. 
better name. Even though, again, it's not wrong, it's not bad, it's a lowercase t truth. The, the capital T truth of this day is not calling it Palm Sunday, but Lamb Selection Day. In the culture of the Jewish culture, during this time, on this day, and this would be, again, th this is just days before the Passover celebration, the Passover meal. This is all culturally significant to the Bible and not to us. If you were maybe someone that came from a Jewish family, like a friend of mine over here is, you would probably know about this. But maybe you don't. But the, the whole idea of Passover goes back to Old Testament. I mentioned it last week. It's, the, it's, it's referring to the time during the whole Egypt when they were enslaving the Jewish people, the Hebrews. And then God rescues the Hebrews. And, and one of these plagues come on, on the Egyptians. And one of the plagues is this like death angel goes over all, all over Egypt. And God says basically what you got to do is put a, a blood of a lamb over your door. And the death angel will pass over. That's how you, how you escape death. This is what they celebrate. And back to this, they do it every year. And they're doing it during this season. And on this Sunday, days before the Passover meal, this was Selection Lamb Sunday. Where you select the lamb that you're going to sacrifice personally. And also the one they would do for all people. Or, or, or the, whole, the whole Jewish area. This is a big day. And what Jesus is saying, I'm the lamb. Come after me. I'll take it. Jesus, again, just like Lazarus, we too had a death mark placed on us by the enemy around us. And the enemy wants us removed. But Jesus took the death mark on us. He's the lamb who died in our place. This Jesus is incredible. And he gets all the glory. And the enemy I'm talking about is not, you know, um, Fox News or CNN or some political party. The enemy is the enemy. Satan is demons. He has a death mark on us. And Jesus takes it for us. He says, you kill me instead. Again, the Lazarus effect is a life-changing result caused by Jesus. It's something that happens to the believer, through the believer, and around the believer. And today, we are reminded of what it looks like around us. In fact, if you keep reading the story as it concludes with Lazarus, the last part that's mentioned about him, it's in this part here. Many in the crowds had seen Jesus call Lazarus or out of the tomb, raising him from the dead. And they were telling others about it, that this was the reason that so many went out to meet Jesus, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, this is after the parade, is he walking, is he walking in, they said, there's nothing we can do now. Look, everyone has gone after him. This is the last time that, that Lazarus' name is mentioned in the Bible. We never see him coming back again. He's not in the book of Acts. Ne never again. There's church tradition and history as to what happened to Lazarus. And, and we do know this, he died. Again, like we all die. Jesus is the only one to die to never die again. And resurrect to never die again. Again, Lazarus died again. Yeah. But this guy had a story to tell. And no matter, no matter what happened to him, no matter where he went, back home to Bethany or moved somewhere else, he had a story to tell. And the story would, would result in people saying, I want Jesus. And look at the, the, the priests. They're so, they're so mad at this. Now, now everyone's going to go after Jesus if they, if they hear the story. It's too good. To pass up. And what the story is, is not only what happened with Jesus. From the tomb, or, or from, the, from, the, from the cross to the tomb into life again. But also for you and I. We have a story of, of, of something that killed us. A trauma that we went through. Something that, that was just so horrific. We have a story to tell how Jesus came and rescued us. Not only way back then, but keeps rescuing us now. We have a story to share. And this story is what people need to see in us. And remember, the last point is, is the big point today. The, the Lazarus effect will lead people to receive you or want you removed. But remember, this response should be because of what Jesus has repaired in you and not because of what you've rebuked in them. I, I, I'm not going to tell you to stop rebuking people. You've got you to do what you've got to do. I will say this, that when you see God's strategy on how he leads people to him, you see it. Even Paul mentioned this, that he would choose to, to use kindness as the way to draw us to him. Kindness. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think rebuke is so kind. I think when you and I stand on our little soapboxes and just tell people how wrong they are for voting a certain way or believing in a certain way, we are just ripping them apart and tearing them down. But when we share with them the repair that Jesus has brought to our lives, we go to the A point. We dismiss the Z point for now. We come to the A point. 
And we say, Jesus has changed my life. And I want you to know that. Friends, there, there's some of you, I'm telling you that, that when people hear your story, they're going to be just, they're going to be blown away by it. But what you are doing, you're shooting yourself in the foot. There's no, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's not a crazy reason why your friends won't come with you to church. It's not crazy for me to think why your family members won't come with you to church. It, it, why, your, why your work people don't come with you to church. Why, why they don't want to hear about Jesus. Because what you're leading with is something false. Let the false self die. Let those lowercase t truths die in comparison to the capital T truth, truth that Jesus saves. And friend, instead of getting so passionate about that specific topic, how about you get passionate about sharing that Jesus has saved your butt? And you tell people how he has done that. And you watch and see how they respond, whether they are Republican or Democrat or progressive or conservative or gay or straight or whatever it is in the world that wants to categorize people. You watch how Jesus blows those categories away, how he blows all those prejudices away with his repairing, life-saving, capital T truth. Share that instead and watch how people respond. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, we need you. And God, forgive us for leading with lowercase t truths and rebuking people. God, forgive us, Lord, for, for getting so distracted from the capital T truth that you've saved us. Father, we thank you for Lazarus and the story that, that you remind us with, and just what you did in his life, how people wanted to welcome him or remove him simply because of what you did in his life. He didn't say anything. He just showed it by walking into a room, breathing. Father, may you allow us to show it to our home, people in our home, people at work, people in our neighborhoods. Help people in our lives to see your life-saving grace and how you have repaired things in our life and how you're continuing to repair things in our life. And Father, please help us to remember and to, to honor what we call Palm Sunday. And it's not bad to call it that. But Lord, help us to remember that the significance, the deeper significance, this Lamb Selection Sunday. Remember that you, you took the, the death mark for us. And God, we thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, in this time of communion, I'm going to invite you to go get your communion packets. They're in the back. And what they're there for is, is to, you get a little, little, little element as a little wafer symbolic of his body broken and juice symbolic of his body bled. I invite you to, to take those packets, come on back to your seat, and just have a moment with Jesus and thank him. Just thank him for being so good, for being the lamb that, that sacrificed himself for us, who took the death mark for you and me. Just thank him. And, and thank him that, that he's given you hope that things can be repaired. And that things, things can change. Thank him for that. If you need prayer, I'll have a friend over here pray for you. And I'll be over here to pray for you. And I, I, I want to ask you to specifically pray for the names on these bulbs. That they would come to know Jesus. Then they would come with you next Sunday for Easter. All right. Now you're invited to go get your packets. And come on over here for prayer if you need it. Or come back for worship.